Welcome, everybody, to Sunday Morning Poetry. My name is Kirk Barbera, and today we're going to go through the poem Directive by Robert Frost. Now, continuing this discussion that I've been having, or this personal grappling I've been having with these humanist poems, like Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens, one of my goals is to rest or break the monopoly that religion has on certain emotional concepts like reverence, like exaltation, like glory, like hallelujah, uh, salvation, even peace and serenity are so mired in religion. And, and I don't mean um, m- merely just religious texts, but I also mean the structures of religion and the ways you're supposed to do things. And most worst of all, is the supernatural element. The promise of that you get, like, I don't know why I have to be so clear about this, but people seem to not understand what I mean by supernatural or by afterlife. So there's a metaphorical view of afterlife or of of, uh, uh, life after death in a sense where it's, you know, I learn something new or or you get married so you become a new person. So the old you has died and the new you has uh, uh, risen. And in that sense, I'm very for the idea of, you know, uh, birth and reincarnation and resurrection as I went through last week. But the concept of, you know, that you get your head shot off, you're in a morgue, but yet you still continue in some place. No, that is nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. There's not a shred of evidence for it. So you do not believe it if you're a rational, reasonable human. And so what we need, so that if you believe that you believe in the supernatural, that's all it comes down to. So the point is that there are these concepts like reverence and exaltation that we need to be, um, that, that I think are still relevant even to a person who's an atheist, who's a humanist, who's a secularist, who's a business owner, just trying to start a business. This was Ayn Rand's goal with the Fountainhead. It's why Fountainhead is my and Anthem are my favorite novels from her, because she is t- talking about the upward glance. She is talking about what man can achieve with the material that is around him, that is the starting point of everything, that the world is, and man has a consciousness able of grasping that. And the exaltation you feel is your ability to manipulate, to change, to take over the world, and to order it according to your own values. That is the secular version of this. And today we're going to go into a little bit of the poem. uh, We're going to go into the poem directive, and we'll probably talk about a few other poems. I'm also going to bring up Don Quixote, which is a great story that is relevant to Robert Frost's the uh, his last directive to you. That's right, to each and every one of you. This is an important, um, you know, element of what he's trying to accomplish. So one of the re- one of the things I wanted to start with here is people often ask me why. What is you know, especially business people. Like I've had a business person or a, a, a very successful salesperson who is now running their own office or several offices. And they they would ask me things like, what is the practical, like, what is the point of poetry and literature? Like, I understand reading Stephen King or Grisham or or some, you know, going to a movie and watching something that entertains you for a couple minutes. But what about this deep literature, Kirk, that you're always talking about? And this poem is a great answer to that. It's going to be one of the more confusing poems you're going to read if you stick stick around for me, with me. But there's a lot of deep things here. And what I hope to do is give you a few tools to kind of quarry this, you know, to kind of uh, uh, be a, a stone quarryman going out and digging for diamonds or gold or for marble that is within this poem that you can take out for your own life. That That is the only thing that you can do when you teach poetry, by the way. The only way you can ever really teach poetry is by exposing people to poetry. You can't express or teach poetry through prose, through explanation. You have to, in the same way you experience a a symphony, you have to just experience it. And then you can maybe discuss it or analyze it or think about it, but it's the experiencing that's important. So, but one of the reasons that I think is very relevant here 
And one of the points of this poem and why you should read poetry is it's a cliche in literary or philosophical or self-help circles that people tend to come to these things after a tragedy. So, you know, there's, there's books of, um, I don't remember the name of this book, but there's this book that's coming to mind that was written by a woman who had everything. She was a New York City billionaire or the wife of a, no, I think she, her, she in her own right was a multimillionaire and she married a millionaire and they had so much money they, and they even had a good circle of friends, but there just came a point in her life where um, after, you know, she was in her forties and it just started like piling up life piled on life that it just seemed like it was the same thing after over and over again. And it just kept getting more and more boring and more and more still stilted. And then she started thinking, well, is this all there is to life? And she started getting into a depression. And then she started getting to, once she got low enough on the depression, she got into literature and poetry and philosophy. And um, the wife of Charles Lindbergh, uh, Linda, I cannot remember her name, but she uh, wrote a book called The Gift from the Sea, which is a, a kind of reflection she had after, you know, they found that their child was kidnapped and then murdered. And there's a lot of poetry and literature and, and philosophical insights into that. And this is a cliche in literature, self-help, philosophy, poetry, is that people wait until there's a disaster and then they go to poetry. So here's the analogy that I've come up with in real life. And it's a story that happened uh, and it actually happened to me a long time ago. I was uh, friends and roommates with this young lady. I, I won't name who she is because uh, she's uh, Facebook friends with me. But, you know, we were driving to work. So it was me and several roommates. It was me, her, uh, you know, a couple guy roommates, a whole bunch of people living in this, this uh, big place. Uh, and one day, and we all, most of us worked together, except one person worked somewhere else, but we all worked at the same place. And so one day I was actually, you know, we were driving to work together in separate cars because we were going to go elsewhere afterwards. So we didn't take the same car. So she was ahead of me. And then she decided, um, or no, I, I called her to see if she wanted to go get breakfast first or at this place. I was like, oh, let's go over here. So, you know, this was uh, 2000 and, uh, oof. Five, maybe 2005 so it's a long time ago so people weren't quite as adept with cell phones and driving as they are today so anyway she you know i i could see it happening in slow motion i get i called her we're driving luckily we're not driving super fast it's not on a highway but we're driving on the uh, on a road and she reaches down to grab the phone and then she you know looks up and swerves hard to the left because she was steering, veering this way to the right, and then swerves hard to the right. So she smashes into the car left her, and then she smashes into the sidewalk. And I'm just like sitting there like, uh, okay. And it made me realize that one of the things that's, uh, that rele that's relevant in, um, in, in living life or in driving a car is it you know, a good driver is not someone who can just stay in the lines on a regular basis because that's kind of silly when you think about it. Because everybody can, any fool can stay in the lines while they are, um, you know, while, while they are driving. That's, you could teach a 12 year old to stay in the lines while they're driving. What you can't teach is what to do in chaos. What to do when you're driving 80 miles per hour in San Antonio, or in Texas, you know, speed limit 75 on the freeways uh, outside of town. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are driving 80 miles per hour. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an idiot. A, a literal, like, mindless person can drive that fast and stay in the lines on perfect weather conditions on a great day with a great car. That's not a very difficult thing to do. What is difficult is um, when you're driving and there's a snowstorm and you're going 75 miles per hour and a truck goes out in front of you and collapses and you know blows up all around you, then the, the issue becomes, um, you know, can you swerve and handle those situations. And that's what's really important here. And I, I think the and the analogy here of, of what that is, 
is the ability to pre to to plan for the chaos and this is why i'm so interested in jordan peterson and by the way if you're curious i am just sharing this on um social media sharing the, the page that's why i'm kind of looking down a little bit but i'll um we'll get to it in, in a second but one of the things that <clears throat> i um you know one of the the reasons i'm bringing this up is people always ask me why I read literature and poetry as a regular part of life and the reason is because you don't want to fucking wait until a you know a big rig crashes in front of you all your shit is everywhere and you got to swerve through the chaos of that because the fact of the matter is that that is going to happen in life and so the purpose of reading poetry and literature and philosophy and self-help development books is not that you are now currently living in chaos but that you recognize the truth that one day you will and so you are preparing for it at least that's one reason that's not the only reason i won't say that that's all there is to um you know uh, uh um reading literature but it's part of it and it's one thing that's important when you're considering um when you're considering getting into poetry and, and literature and such so that's the analogy of of that i think is really relevant here when when understanding what's going on with poetry and uh, why you should read it. And that is one of the directives that Robert Frost has for you in this poem, directive. Now, there's, I, I need to set this up because Robert, Fro this poem is extraordinarily confusing the first time you hear it and probably the second, third, fourth time. But this is what I think is important about poetry is that poetry needs to be read and heard aloud first couple of times so that you can fall in love with the euphony, the, the sound, the meter, the harmonies, you know, how everything comes together. So it will sound good and it'll sound delightful before you even recognize that it's, um, you know, good and enjoyable. <clears throat> so we're going to go through this poem, but first I wanted to uh, read a, a poem that's not as complicated called A Psalm of Life by Henry w w Wadsworth Longfellow. We're not going to analyze or, or do a converse with verse with this poem, but I think in hearing it, it will help you a little bit in understanding the journey that we need to go through when we go to poem poetry and how we need to um, order our lives, you know, and, and find serenity. And, and this is going to be part of Robert Frost's directive, I believe, is helping you in finding direct uh, serenity, but not in a cliche way of find serenity by just going inward and going um and feeling good about yourself. I mean, he's actually trying to give you directives on how to find serenity, but he does it in, um, let me read the little section from it. Uh, the way that St. Mark did at the end of the, the gospel of, you know, in uh, Christ's gospel of St. Mark, where he speaks in parables so that only those who can hear will be saved. And I don't have the exact quote, but it's basically the idea that Christ spoke in parables, and, and this poem by Frost is a parable. And the reason he spoke in parables is so it's only for those who can hear. And so one of the things that's really um, pleasurable about this poem directed by Robert Frost is that the more you read it, the more all of a sudden it feels like someone is speaking out of it directly to you and it and you start to recognize in yourself the truth that robert frost is trying to get at and this is one of the reasons why poetry is always seen and thought of as like some kind of magical ideal now by the way if you have any questions i know i have a couple uh, viewers if you have any questions about the poem or uh, anything about literature you know religion that's what we're trying to get at we're trying to break the monopoly that religion has on emotional concepts that's our goal with religious with uh, Sunday morning poetry here. So go ahead and you know ask any questions. But first, uh, unless you have a question now, I'm going to read really quickly a Psalm of Life by Henry Wordsworth, Wadsworth Longfellow. That will help you understand directive by Robert Frost. Reading one poetry to help you with another one. So Psalm of Life. You know this is a psalm, just like you would at. at a church, you'd read a psalm, but this is not a psalm for the afterlife or for heaven, but for life on earth. Okay, tell me not in mournful numbers 
Life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Art is long, and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral, funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, broad field of battle, in the life in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. This is the important part. Trust no future, however, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God our head. Lives of great men all remind us. We can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. So that's the, the poem by, by uh, Wordsworth. And one of the things that you're going to see in the poem, the directive poem, is this idea of going backwards and, and exploring the past of men who came before you. And we're in the spiritual realm, right? Not necessarily in the religious spiritual realm, but in the, the values of your consciousness. So, for instance, I'm reading um, Jason and the Argonauts or the Argonautica by Apollo. Um, Apollon, Apollon, Apollonius of Rhodes, as I think it's like the third century AD. It's an ancient text. And in the text, the story is a bunch of adventurers, men who are the greatest adventurers of Greece, band together to go on a quest because that's what adventurers do. That's what men should do. And that's what boys are inclined to do. This is one of the reasons why um, what's called MMORPG, Massive Multiplayer, online role-playing games is so seductive to young boys. Um, you know, it's the same thing with games and like going on adventures because if you, there's just a, a certain emotional desire that boys have and men have to go do that kind of adventure. And that is somewhat lost in our modern time. So we're going to, you know, explore that a little bit in the poem directive. So we're in this poem directive and we're, we're talking about going past, going in the past to understand the future. Um, okay, so let's let's actually go into the poem first, and I'm gonna do my best to read to let this agenda um, go through section by section of what I'm reading. Now, the important thing, you know, as I'm reading to understand, is that you ha you have to recognize that in this poem directive which is trying to, again, it's, it's a directive. It's, it's like a guide. It's telling you go this way direction, but it's also, you could think of it in a military sense of like, here's the directive, like a manual almost for, um, you know, uh, a, a, almost a manual for doing things right and, and how to, you know, practical guide. So he's kind of playing on words already at the beginning, right? With the title directive. If you want to understand this poem, you have to have a little bit of patience. So I recommend reading along with me, Google Directive by Robert Frost, or listening very carefully. I will read through it uh, more than once. It's, it's not super short, but it's not super long. It's probably about a five-minute read. And so I'm going to read through it. It will not make any sense. If it does, then you're a genius. You need to have your own poetry podcast because that's amazing. It did not make any sense to me. I'll just quote Randall Gerald, the critic, uh, the poetry critic from uh, 50, 60 years ago. And he said that Frost is one of those poets that you do not need to understand to enjoy. And I think that's very true. You do not need to understand Frost to enjoy him. But as you understand him, you will enjoy him more. 
Okay. So let's go into this poem. Let's take a, uh, a really quick overview of the idea that the first thing you need to recognize in the beginning of the poem is that he is telling you to go back. He's telling you to go back into this era, prehistory, into the imagination. So we're going on a journey. It starts off back out of all this, now too much for us. Back in a time made simple by the loss of detail burned, dissolved, and broken off like graveyard marble sculpture in the weather. So he's, tell he's basically saying, go back, go back. Now, where are we going? Where is this place? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that afterward, but just recognize that he's telling you to go back into some imaginary prehistoric place, some ancient place where all men have gone back. And you'll see that he's trying to help you get lost in order to find yourself. It's one of those amazing paradoxes that you get in poetry like this. Okay, so let's give it a shot. Be patient. It won't make sense. But stick around and be patient, listen through, and we'll go through it line by line, and we'll do what I call is a converse with verse. And remember, the objective here is um, to understand the poem to the best of our abilities and to kind of experience it for the first time, if you haven't experienced it. Okay, so directive, I'm going to read here, by Robert Frost. Back out of all this now, too much for us. Back in a time made simple by the loss of detail, burned, dissolved, and broken off, like graveyard marble sculpture in the weather. There is a house that is no more a house, upon a farm that is no more a farm, and in a town that is no more a town. The road there, if you'll let a guide direct you who only has a heart at your getting lost, may seem as if it should have been a quarry. Great monolithic knees, the former town long since gave up pretense of keeping covered. And there's a story in a book about it. Besides the wear of iron wagon wheels, the ledges show lines ruled southeast and northwest, the chisel work of an enormous glacier that braced his feet against the Arctic Pole. You must not mind a certain coolness from him, still said to haunt this side of Panther Mountain. Nor need you mind the serial ordeal of being watched from forty cellar holes, as if by eye pairs out of forty firkins. As for the woods' excitement over you, that sends light rustle rushes to their leaves, charge that to upstart's inexperience. Where were they all not twenty years ago? They think too much of having shaded out a few old pecker fretted apple trees. Make yourself up a cheering song of how someone's road home from work this once was, who may be just ahead of you on foot or creaking with a buggy load of grain. The height of the adventure is the height of country where two village cultures faded into each other. Both of them are lost. And if you're lost enough to find yourself by now, pull in your ladder and behind you, pull in your ladder road behind you and put a sign up closed to all but me. Then make yourself at home. The only field now left, no bigger than a harness gall, First, there's the children's house to, of make-believe, some shattered dishes underneath a pine. The playthings in the playhouse of the children weep for what little things could make them glad. Then for the house that is no more a house, but only a belly-laced cellar hole, now slowly closing like a dent in dough. This was no playhouse, but a house in earnest. Your destination and your destinies, a brook that was the water of the house, cold as a spring as yet so near its source, too lofty and original to rage. 
We know the valley's streams that, when aroused, will leave their tatters hung on barb and thorn. I have kept hidden in the instep arch of an old cedar at the waterside a broken drinking goblet like the grail. Under a spell, so the wrong ones can't find it, so can't get saved, as St. Mark says, they mustn't. I stole the goblet from the children's playhouse. Here are your waters and your watering place. Drink and be whole again beyond confusion. <laughs> One of the first reactions, hopefully, is that there's something there, but you don't know what it is. And that is why poetry is the place where confusion, be, where chaos and confusion become order and clarity. As Robert Frost puts it, a good poem should begin in delight and end in wisdom. It sounds pleasant, but then hopefully eventually it becomes even more pleasant and you start to realize that there is something there that you didn't recognize upon first reading. Now, we've all on a light level held this experience where we went through a, a book or even watched a movie that we really enjoyed and that was maybe a deep movie, not just a comedy. And then we watched it again, maybe a couple of days later, maybe a couple of years later, maybe a decade later. And we saw things that we never thought we understood at the beginning and we understood it differently. So we've all had that experience on some level. And so the point is that this experience is recognizable. And it's the experience of ordering the world, either your own inner world or the outer world. And poetry is often focused on the inner world, of course. And that's where the directives are aimed at, is at your inner world. So you need to read poetry in order to gain the skill, the value of having a comfort in chaos as such. Now, a comfort in chaos is essential because if you are so anxious, if you're so nervous, the second you feel a little bit of chaos, you're going to run straight to the, the nearest border of order. And that border of order could be bad. It could be authoritarianism. It could be, you know, communist or Nazi Germany, or it could be, you know, any number of bad things. So the, the ability to gain a comfort in chaos is to feel comfortable when you are uncomfortable, to feel comfortable when you do not know something. And instead of going and trying to grasp onto any order that you can grasp onto, you go out there and you continue the journey through chaos. You continue to to um, you continue on the height of the adventure. Is the height of country where two villages, two village cultures faded. So in this fluxing world where nothing makes sense right now, that's the world you should go to, and that is moving higher and higher and more and more challenging and difficult than anything you could ever imagine. And that is something that only literature can really teach you. Some people may have it inbred in them to some degree from an early age, but you must have that sense of poetic, you know, uh, view of the world. I'll uh, read us a, a quick section before we go into the converse and verse. I want to read a couple things from some books. This is a very good book by Nathaniel Hawthorne that nobody ever talks about because everyone's always so focused on. Um, a Scarlet Letter, which is a pretty good book, but this book is, I think, better. And it's A Marble Fawn. And it's about art. And it's about history. And it's about the reality and the interplay between the two. But here's a little quick section about art. I won't go into the book a whole lot. But Hawthorne is talking about um, seeing through the eyes of an angel, which is what art can allow you to do. And I like that idea of seeing viewing the world through the not just your own eyes, but through the eyes of an angel. Scenes delicately imagined, lacking perhaps the reality which comes only from a close acquaintance with life. 
but so softly touched with feeling and fancy that you seemed to be looking at humanity with angels' eyes. So you, when you read literature, when you read poetry, you have all of a sudden new eyes to look from. And that's a cliche, right? It gives you new perspective. But the question is, is that perspective better? <laughs> and uh, Hawthorne is saying that with great art, that yeah, it could be better. Poets have been described as above average livers of life. Not your liver or wherever your liver is, but a, an above average liver, like they live above average. And so many of us get stuck in the mundane, mundane of the world. And we think, oh, well, let me go on an adventure to Rome. And they go to Rome. And, you know, I tell this story a lot, but I, <laughs> I find it fascinating that people I know, very, you know, well-to-do, smart, nice people, go to Rome or to Europe or on all, all these adventures, and they essentially live the same kind of lives that they live here in America. You know, uh, the story I tell is uh, a friend of mine once told me after he and I had had lots of discussions of art and he felt bad about what he had missed on his study abroad in Rome is, you know, he, uh, one, he lived across the street from the Vatican and never went, which is crazy to me, <laughs> never go to the art. But anyway, um, but the other one that I've heard is these, you know, young college kids, they go and they study abroad there in Rome and you know, this one guy was telling me the story of he was walking down these old cobblestone, uh, you know, paths and some, you know, native that he had met there was taking him somewhere. And he goes to this old archway, they open this old creaky door. And, you know, these pathways may have been thousands of years old and they go in and he hears a little tinkling of music. He hears some laughter and he goes a little bit farther and he's really curious and excited. And then all of a sudden he walks through around this corner you know, again, this ancient building with these old cobblestone, you know, uh, stone marble or, or brick laid from thousands of years ago. And he walks around this corner and, you know, his eyes are just blasted with this sight of young people playing beer pong. <laughs> and, you know, I always find that one of the most atrocious stories ever because I like beer pong. There's nothing wrong with beer pong. But the point of travel should not be to be the same person when you leave as you come back. You know, if you're going to travel, you know, geographically in real life, you should try to be someone else when you come back. And, and that's what poetry trains you how to do. Poetry is the place to go to travel to become a new person, to become a better person, to change the moon. You know, life is long. It's the part of life we don't hear about is that you know unless you're eight you know 60 70 80 90 years old life is pretty long in general and there's a lot more going forward than there is back until you get to that middle age and late age then then there's more back than forward and you know that so that's a different perspective of course but if you're not 50 60 70 80 90 years old there's you know more forward than back and so you should be focused on that the fact that life can get mundane and boring and not good, and you can do the same types of activities forever. And what are you going to do? Just have a whole bunch of pleasurable experiences and die in a year or two. I mean, that seems like not the best answer. So Robert Frost is giving us some directives here. And let's go through some of these directives. Um, now, remember by directive, we're talking again about, him giving you direction. He's saying, do this. This is his directive. But then there's a, um, you know, an, almost an ironic twist because in civil administration, it has come to mean practical instructions. But there's also a little bit more, you know, to it because this poem's no cut and dried answer to a practical problem. It's not like, you know, you get, you know, you have someone in your family pass away and then all of a sudden it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, all of a sudden this poem will just solve all your problems. The poetry and literature isn't that simple. Unfortunately, it's not um, going, you know, it's not like a pill that you take once and then you're, you're cured. It's a, a training. Poetry is it's kind of a training. Okay, so this first line. Back out of all this now too much for us, Back in a time made simple by the loss of detail burned, dissolved, and broken off, like graveyard marble sculpture in the weather. 
There is a house that is no more a house upon a farm that is no more a farm and in a town that is no more a town. Now, what are we talking about here? <laughs> so we have this, um, I wish I could display all of it, but we have this directive to go back out of all this now. What is this now that he's talking about? Well, this now is the infinite amount of sensual experiences upon which we find ourselves. And it's one of the difficulties of living in the now. And it's one of the reasons why so many people uh, often re regress into living in the past or living in some imaginative future that they hope to live in one day. Is because, you know, it's um, there's another term that's been a modern formulation of this is um, FOMO, fear of missing out. And the fear of missing out is that there is something infinite, like in the now, right now, like I'm Kirk Barbera, it's 11.20 a.m., on Sunday, I don't even know what day it is, Sunday the 7th, or the 8th, excuse me, Sunday the 8th, right now there is, you know, um, jazz playing at some brunch at Rosella at the Rand, there's, you know, another brunch place around the corner, there's there's people that I know probably at Flying Saucer, I mean, you know, a bar around here, all the places I know are bars, it's not a good thing, there's, <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's, you know, book festivals going on places, there's Austin an hour away, I mean, there's objectivists that I, I know up there I could try and hang out with. I mean, there's an infinite amount of nows, an infinite amount of things to do in the now. And so people often, myself included, like I, I'm talking to myself, we often have this desire to escape the now through some form of, you know, re uh, regressing into the past, regressing into the world of imagination. This is why so many people go to concerts all the time, go to plays all the time, go to movies. I mean, movies, we think of them as an escape, and often they are an escape. Often books are an escape. They are an escape from the now. However, I'm not saying that the escape or you know doing that is necessarily a bad thing, but that is a part of what it is, is that you know there is this infinite now, and to some, some people, we don't know what to do with it, and so we just regress into nothing, right? We just regress into the past, and there which is fine, but the problem becomes if you stay there <laughs> and you don't take an action from any, you know, from anything like that, uh, from the past. So when you're back, so he's calling you to do this though. He's calling you to go back out of this now that is too much for us. Back in a time made simple, so there's less things you can do because there's less possibilities, possibly is one way of looking at that. Back in a time made simple by the loss of detail. That's a problem with the now, is the now has too many details. Because the now, like the whole world around us is infinite. So there's too many details. But if you can focus your mind on a specific element of the past or sp specific time in the past, then you can rid yourself of the infinite amount of details. Now, in that place, there is a house that is no more a house upon a farm that is no more a farm and in a town that is no more a town. Okay, the next section. So we're talking about the road. Now listen to the way I read this. Excuse me. <laughs> the road there, if you'll let a, a guide direct you who only has a heart, you're getting lost, may seem... So he's talking about the road there. The road from that house... This is an imaginary house in the past. This is a past house. This is a house that doesn't actually exist. It could be referring to, for instance, the house of God. So the house of God may be some kind of symbolic representation of this ancient prehistoric you know, imaginary house that man throughout history tried to create. And this is why he, I think he does the analogy, uh, or the simile, I should say, of uh, this time before time like graveyard marble sculpture in the weather. And, you know, graveyard marble. So he doesn't talk about a cross, but you could talk about all the different symbologies and all the different symbols used by religions throughout history, you know, from ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian to, you know, Mesopotamian, whatever it is, all these different symbols are graveyard marble sculptures in weather, which is time, right? Weathered through time. Weather has two different meanings. It could mean literally the rain and the, the, the wind, and it could also mean weathered as though, you know, as in over time, every object becomes weathered and, and 
beaten down by Father Time. So he could be, he's probably talking about that. That's my assumption. And what we're getting here is his view that we're trying to find out what all of these people have in common, what all of these symbolisms have in common. What do they all have in common? So, you know, and, and he finds in this place back uh, in a time made simple by the loss of detail, burned, dissolved, like graveyard, marble sculpture, and the weather. He finds there that there's a house, but it's no more a house, which I think is a reference to like um, religious houses of God that as, you know, modern civilization has progressed, have devolved, have dissolved. They're not as prevalent in our lives today, unless you're in San Antonio, Texas. But they're generally not as present in many places in America, for instance, and especially in Europe, as they were in the past. So there is a house that is no more a house upon a farm that is no more a farm, and in a town that is no more a town. The road there, now he doesn't say if it's from or, or you know, away from there, but the road in that house um, may seem as if it should be a quarry. Well, a quarry is definitely this deep... You know, usually it's like a hole or a pit. And, you know, in that pit, you can find marble, right? You're, you're digging a quarry is usually for marble or something that you're digging up. So he's saying that there's something valuable in this road. So in the road itself, and you know, one of his more most famous poems is The Road Not Taken. So this could possibly give you some you know indication of how he might think of that road not taking, but the journey itself, we've heard this before at cliche, the journey itself is the, um, you know, where the value is. There's value in the road itself. And so if you think of like a quarry, the, the road as quarry, then the place you walk upon, the, the footsteps in the sand of time that you're walking upon and putting these footsteps in, that is a place that has spiritual or some kind of value. And I think in this case, he's talking about spiritual. And the reason I think that is because he does talk about St. Mark and about the grail and um, things of that nature. He talks about, um, you know, a story and a book about it. You know, and he's talking about the men who have dsh, quarried. He's just hitting that hammer. And I, this is, you know, bringing back to, excuse me, something that I love about the Fountainhead is when Howard Rourke is in the quarry. So he has tried to reach his version of heaven on earth, which is building his buildings his way. He doesn't achieve it. So he goes to quarry. Now, to the you know, he goes to a rock quarry. Now, Rourke is a genius. He's he's a genius level, and everybody who meets him, even people who don't like him, like the dean of his architecture school, knows that he is a genius. They know that he has something special. He's he's a mathematical and an engineering genius. And they tell him, get into civil, you know, go into civil engineering. But he won't. He wants to build his own way, build in the way that he he envisions. That's the life he wants to live. That to him is the highest and the most exalted way of living, is to live on his own terms and to achieve the vision that he sought to, uh, to achieve. And so when he fails at one point in the story, he has to go to the um, he has to go to the quarry to survive. What I love about this story is how the plot is so beautifully constructed. And this is something that Rand never gets credit for. But it's at that point that the love interest, Dominique, sees him. Now, from her world, he is at the lowest. But in his world, he's just a part of his world. Quarrying from rock is not what he wants to be doing ultimately, but he doesn't look at it as a punishment. It's actually still the expression of his ability to alter the world according to the vision of his values. He doesn't do it you know, in building a skyscraper that he wants to, but he's still living on his own terms. This is the reverence, the exaltation, the glory, the hallelujah, the emotional concepts that Rand is saying. Religion has monopolized. He holds them internally and does not need you or your religion, I should say. But Dominique, the love interest, who understands this to some degree, she is in his world, but she's also trapped and lost and confused in the outer world of the values that other people hold. And so it is not a coincidence in the book, and nothing is a coincidence in a great work of art, that Rourke is, at, is beneath Dominique visually and plot-wise. You know, she's like this rich woman um, who's 
you know, at her summer house of her father's summer house. And she sees and she looks down and sees this man who is a God on earth. And he's a God, not in, not just in this, again, not in a supernatural sense, but a God in the sense of the type of man who creates gods, right? Like the consciousness and of the past of a Homer who created and of a Hesiod who combined and, and put made real on paper, the gods that we have always worshiped. So my point is that the quarry of the journey, the journey or the path has value. And we know that, right? Like people always say, it's not the end, it's the journey that matters and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and what is the, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing with new eyes, as Proust said, I'm looking up at my wall because I have it on my wall. <laughs> you know, and so we have this idea of a journey. And the journey is valuable. So that's what we're talking about here. And, you know, it's the beautiful way of putting it, to, to put it in the sense of the road there may seem as if it should have been a quarry. And then, of course, there's a little parenthetical side note where he says, the road there, if you'll let a guide direct you who only has a heart at your getting lost, may seem as if it should have been a quarry. So he's also saying at the same time that this, guide that he's giving you here this guidance um, is one that he is wanting to have you lose yourself and we all have a sense of losing ourselves selves when we um, one if you've ever done psychedelics you definitely lose yourself which i have done psychedelics or if you've done um you know if you've gone on a uh, a great rock concert or a symphony where you just kind of close your eyes and you're just kind of lost and you don't feel a sense of your own body anymore. And you kind of feel there's a loss in that, but we're, we're going to find out where finding yourself is in that sense of loss. Okay. Let us continue. Um, okay. So <laughs> this one I do not understand completely. I think I have an idea, though, but let's give it a shot. Great monolithic knees, the former town long since gave up pretense of keeping covered. And there's a story in a book about it, besides the wear of iron wagon wheels. The ledges show lines ruled southeast, northwest, the chisel work of enormous glacier. And the glacier is reified or thingified, or it's uh, uh, anthropomorphized, I should say. It's made into a person. It's a glacier with a capital G, not any glacier. And it's a glacier that braced his feet against the Arctic Pole. So in this um, monolithic, great monolithic thing here i don't you know so it's it's important to keep context of where we are in the story here so one you need to have been lost sufficiently are you do you have the heart of getting lost on this road to this imaginary back place this place of backness of you know prehistory this imaginative place of the the poet but that also is a place that we all can go to you know when you go to church for instance Excuse me, and you you're you're reading and you're you're reading the same psalms that everyone else is reading. You're reading or the same Bible. You're reading an ancient text and you're all together. You know, a hundred people in a church are all at the same time, their minds are going to the same place simultaneously. For better or for worse, that's what they're doing. Right. And when you go to school, that's one of the goals of you know many parts of classes is that the teacher is up there teaching you about physics. And hopefully, if you, if everyone, if let's say theoretically, all fifty people in a class on biology is talking about germs, well, that teacher has successfully transported your mind from the classroom into the world of germs. Right, all of you together, and, and that's part of what you know. I think. Uh, Frost is talking about here. He's saying, let's all go back in a time to this imaginary place where there's a house that is no longer, that is not a house, or there's a house that is no more a house. And we're going to see what this kind of looks like. And long since gave, you know, and great monolithic knees, the former town long since gave up pretense of keeping covered. I only can think of great monolithic knees, K N E E S. I can only imagine that he's meaning something like the monoliths of great religions that, you know, um, 
there's a poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley where it goes, I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. And in this, you know, and the idea is that over time, this, this, this huge godlike man that was worshipped as a god is now all that's remained of him are just two trunkless uh, legs of stone, uh, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. So you just get the legs. And there's no torso. There's nothing. It's just legs of stone. And that's what I think of like great monolithic knees. You just get, you know, uh, of Jesus, uh, all that's really left are just monolithic knees. There's just, there's just, you know, and and you might even take it as a uh, an analogy or an, an example of falling to your knees. So he's also playing on that idea of falling on your knees. And, and so in this back place where you find this house that is no more a house, which could be symbolism for religion that has faded over time or is fading in this modern area era. Remember, Frost is modern. He's writing this poem at this last poem, great poem he writes. This is in 1947 or something. It's right after World War II. So great monolithic of knees, the former town long since gave up pretense of keeping covered. So, you know, it's something about not covering the, the monolith anymore. We don't, maybe we don't have reverence to it anymore. And there's a story in a book about it. So again, we're back on that idea of the road, the journey from that house is quarries. There's a quarry there, which means you can find great marble pieces. Like you're, you're digging in some, digging for something. Besides the wear of iron wagon wheels, besides the uh, wear of iron wagon wheels, the ledges show lines ruled southeast northwest. So we see this, you know, the ledges or of maybe the road he's talking about or the iron wagon wheels. So we live in a time today where it's so easy to travel all around the world that we take it for granted. Right? And we forget about the era of the iron wagon wheels, where it was really difficult to do anything. And you know, if you go back hundreds or even thousands of years, one of the examples I give a lot is Marcus Aurelius, the ancient Roman emperor, was the richest, most powerful man on the planet. And he had to write down his will and testament every time he went on a long journey because he thought he would die. Because he, he, excuse me, because he thought he was going to die because it was possible. I mean, when was the last time you went on a plane and wrote down your, your will and testament when you, you know, go from California to New York or from New York to Europe or something? I mean, wh- you don't do that very often because it's not likely that you're going to die on this journey because things have gotten really well. Our systems and our monoliths are, are you know, well-designed and, you know, not perfect, but they're well-designed. But, uh, excuse me. But if we're going back in this time in history, in prehistory, in the imagination of the poet, there's a story about a book. There's a story in a book about this journey, by the way. And they, during that time, maybe the time of Cain and, Cain and Abel, besides the wear of iron wagon wheels, that's where we're at. We're at a time of iron wa- wagon wheels, so the era of iron. And the ledges show lines of people going southeast and northwest and the chisel work of an enormous glacier. So this big glacier. Um, and one way to look at that glacier, the personification of the great monolithic knees and the figure of the enormous glacier bracing his feet against the pole gives some idea of what the makers of the iron wagon wheels and their successors had to contend with. A certain coolness is natural in these primitive, primeval forces toward the modern over-civilized pilgrim. So we we might have, I, I can't stress this enough. I'm trying to really grapple with this and help you understand the importance of this idea that we're, we are creating this world of the past. And it's a past that we don't respect the challenges of it. If I have any effect on a single human, the only thing I hope I inspire you to do is to challenge you to read something that you that is difficult for you. Because 
that is something I think we lost. We have a certain coolness toward the past. And so we have lost this desire, this ability, this goal, this striving, this value of reading things that are above our pay grade, as I put it, that are so hard that we don't really know. And so what most of us do is we throw it away. We say, eh, what's the point? What's the use? That's not for me. I don't need it. That's a waste of time. No, it's not a waste of time. It's valuable. It, there, if you can quarry, which is hard, it's back-breaking work, but that's what the road requires. The road is not a simple saunter down a, a, a forest road. You know, or it's, it's a hike up the Himalayas. It's a hike up Mount Everest. That's what you have to take on to find the spiritual values that they are talking about, that Don Quixote, you know, Cervantes is talking about, that Nathaniel Hawthorne is talking about. Spiritual values are not easily found or discovered or attained or, you know, uh, grappled on with. Patience is not easy. Truth is not easy. Reverence, exaltation, any kind of spiritual values, they are not easily attained. So whatever you believe, respect the problem that it's very challenging, but like lifting weights or running a marathon, it, or or climbing the Himalayas or the the Mount Everest, it is worth it. It is worth it. Okay, let's move on to the next section. Nor need you mind, where am I? Nor need you mind the serial S-E-R-E-I-A-L, ordeal of being watched from 40 cellar holes. 40 cellar holes. And we'll talk about peep shows in a second. As if by eye pairs, but uh, uh, as if uh, uh, by eye pairs out of 40 firkins. Now I'll put this on the screen. 40, or a firkin is a small cask. I spelled that wrong. Cask, not cast. A small cask formerly used for liquids, butter, fish, things like that. But it's a small cask. And (laughs) I think one of the things he's talking about here is, um, you know, this reference to the serial ordeal taken with the overt mention of the grail at the end. So you have to put this all in context, which is why before you analyze anything, you should read the whole thing through to get the ending because you need the whole story. But you know, it gives us the clues that of, of what we're talking about with the story in a book about it. You know, we're talking about mythology. We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about ancient Greek mythology. We're talking about Hesiod and Homer and all, the, you know, um, Jason, the Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes. We're talking about Miguel Cervantes. We're talking about Hawthorne. We're talking about all the great spiritual books that have been put down, you know, Dante uh, put down for us to quarry. That, I think, is where we're going. Our journey, too, is a quest, that age-old mythical pattern. The modern night's serial ordeal is the remembrance of those who decided to go no further. The serial ordeal. So it's an ordeal because we see this recognized over and over again of the, you know, the idea of, which we don't hear a lot about in, as the main anta- protagonist, but the, the hero who goes out and stops and doesn't succeed and fails. We don't put enough emphasis on that, but they, we know they must exist. That a knight errant, by the way, a knight errant is, you know, a medieval ideas, you know, of chivalry, that a knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, knight, goes out looking, you know, errant, goes out looking for adventures and looking for, you know, the spreading of truth and justice and, you know, rectifying wrongs. Basically like, a vigilante, except they had a, a semblance of moral order that they were trying to, and they had a code, which was the chivalric code that you find in the mythology of uh, Britain and the, uh, you know, uh, um, Richard, or the table, the round table, <laughs> not Richard, um, King Arthur, King Arthur and the round table, and they have a whole mythology around that. And that was, you know, by the way, that culture bringing out a new order that out of the chaos after the fall of the Roman Empire. They were, you know, they needed some kind of ordering mechanism, and that's what mythology does. Not only the bloody Bible, that's only one version of it. Anyway, it's an interesting version, but it's only one. 
Okay, so you know the modern knight's serial ordeal. So if you're a modern knight going out trying to bring justice and order to the world, that's what I want to do. And I want to help people order their own minds as I try to order my own mind. And part of that serial ordeal is the remembrance of those who decided to go no further. The dwellers in the ruined cellar holes. You're kind of in this cellar hole. And to imagine them watching him cynically, which is what you get in um, Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote. You get, I think Sancho does this a lot. And a lot of the people that uh, Cervantes, like Cervantes is very cynical. And, and he's basically making fun of this character. It's interesting to think that Othello was written in the same era. It's, it's con- Othello by Shakespeare is contemporary. So the character of Iago is is contemporary to the character of of all the villains and you know Sancho's and the cynical people. So this is when you read literature broadly like that it really gives you a feel that there are certain trends that are bicultural that go through multiple cultures and infect them either for the good or for the bad. You know, you get a spreading of Aristotle after um, the Muslims go far enough into Spain and then Europeans start to study Aristotle um, as it was saved by the Muslims, you know, at that point. Uh, and then you get the Renaissance just a few hundred years later because you get Aristotle spreading throughout it. And it's the same thing with this spreading of the cynicism. There's this cynical view of things that happens in a certain culture that you see it in, uh, you know, a village in Britain and you see it in Spain as well with Cervantes and uh, and, and uh, Miguel de Cervantes and uh, Don Quixote. You get the same kind of cynicism of the Iagos of the world destroying the Othellos and the beautiful Desdemonas, you know, because they're beautiful. Uh, this is one of the things about Othello is people call him a malignant, motive, motiveless malignancy, right? He has no motives. But, you know, in Leonard Peikoff, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, has a much better way of looking at this, that he does have a motive, and it's what Ayn Rand called the destruction for the good for being the good. And it's this idea that his motive in Othello is to destroy Othello. Why does he want to destroy Othello? Because he's good. Because that's the model that Iago has wanted to achieve, but cannot. And you know, because he, can ach- he adores on some level this good that he recognizes as good, he becomes cynical and he wants to destroy it. And he devises a very you know, cynic, uh, destructive way of doing it. So part, that's part of you know, what you have to deal with as a modern knight. You know, people will think of me as silly. They will ignore me. They will not care about what I'm saying because, that, because this is a, a cynical world that we live in and people don't care about trying to go after order and uh, ordering your lives and things of that nature. So... Um, you know, you as the errant knight and in this story must deal too with the comments of those who ignore the past and congratulate themselves on having superseded all the uh, all that and knowing better. And this is one of my favorite things is like, and I'm saying that um, ironically or uh, sarcastically. I don't know how many times I talk to people who are so cynical of everything that happened in the past and yet know almost nothing about what actually happened. You know, this seems to be our cultural milieu, the, the cultural norm is we hate our forefathers because they had slaves, and yet nobody has even read one paper by them. And they wrote a lot of stuff, not to mention the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And yet we hate them. You know, it's so prevalent that even people who who pay lip service and say that, oh, you know, the, they were great men, but they had them slaves, and they're, you know, there's even when they say anything nice about them, oh yeah, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Huh? You know, if you listen to like late night talk show hosts, there's just such a a hatred, cynicism of them because they had a flaw, as though people don't have flaws. So there's a focus. Cynicism is a focus on the bad. And it's the idea that there is no good. You know, the, the, the original cynic, Diogenes, would go around with a light, a, a lantern in the daytime, and he would say, I am looking for a man, a good man. <laughs> so he's got a light in the daytime, walking around, trying to find a good 
man, implying there is no such thing as a good man. And this is cynicism. And that's what we live in. We live in a cynical era. And the uh, story of you know, Don Quixote is that story where he goes around and people ridicule him for wanting to be a knight, for wanting to fight for ideals, for wanting to believe that there is beauty and truth and a, you know, something romantic left in the world. And people constantly, for instance, he'll go to a castle uh, or an inn and people will pretend, he'll think it's a castle because he's you know, living in his own fantasy. And Cervantes believes this to be madness. And the reason he's doing this is because he, he reads so many uh, chivalric stories, by the way. He's infected by this romanticism, which is just an evil infection to believe that there's so, such good and romance and beauty and truth in the world. And so he'll go to like a castle or a, a, an inn or something, and the innkeeper or, you know, he once went to a place where there was a duke of some sort. I can't remember if it was a duke. It was some form of nobility at that era. And they play with him. They toy with him. They pretend he, you know, they snicker aside at his foolishness and they, you know, play this game of him being this knight errant and they send him on these ridiculous journeys that aren't real. And the point is, um, now I'll say that one of the interesting things about it is that to him it is real. Okay, but anyway. So the poet's advice in the face of such ordeals is to remember that we share the same humanity. As all questers in all ages and to rejoice in that. Make yourself up a cheering song about the fellowship of man. By now, we are reaching the height of the adventure. We can forget the historical aspect of it all and pull in the latter road behind us. So let's go into the next section a little bit. All right. One second as I pull this up. Um, as for the woods' excitement over you that sends light rustle rushes to their leaves, charge that to inexperience. <clears throat> where, where were they all not 20 years ago? Now, I believe he's talking about, you know, he's talking to his modern era, and I think it applies to us today too, but where were they all not in a, a, you know, the road leading up to World War II? I, I could be wrong about what he's saying there, but I believe he's saying something like that. Why don't we dig up the, why don't we make a better attempt at digging up or quarrying for the spiritual values that perhaps could have helped prevent this massive atrocity? And by the way, this I think is Jordan Peterson's goal is he's trying to teach us a new way of approaching the humanities because we need to have the tools, whether you agree with everything he says or not, we generally need to have the tools to dig up and to quarry for the values that we need to guide us and to have the wisdom to guide ourselves individually into the future. They think too much of having shaded out a few old peckerfretted apple trees, making yourself up a che make yourself up a cheer cheering song of how someone's road home from work this once was who may be just ahead of you on foot or creaking with a buggy load of grain. The height of the adventure is the height of country where two village cultures faded into each other. Both of them are lost. So first off, um, he says, make yourself up a cheering song of how someone's rode home from work this once was. And remember at the beginning, I read a psalm of life. And that's kind of a cheering song. And he's saying life is real, life is earnest. And then he says, trust no future. And, and, and by the way, let me go back a step. He says, in the world's broad bivouac, in the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Strife, like on the road, like, like you're Don Quixote. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints that another, perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. That is what I think 
Frost is saying here. He says, uh, make yourself up a cheering song of how someone's rode home from work this once was, who may be just ahead of you on foot of, of, or creaking with the buggy load of grain. These are the lives of the great men who, who can remind us that we can make our lives sublime, that we can, we can strive for great things. We don't have to just be, there's nothing wrong with being a CPA, but you should transcend and strive to the next level and always be striving for something better, for more, for achieving and enjoying more. This was the journey of Howard Rourke in the Fountainhead. He, even though he went backward to go forward, he was quote unquote just an architect, but he always strived for more. So you could be quote unquote just a CPA and still strive to be more. And if you get knocked down as he did and you have to go start over and, you know, check you know, uh, numbers for people, you know, that you don't respect or that you don't need to just to make num just to make a living. You're not on the level that you want to be. Okay. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, uh, leave behind us footprints on the sand of time. So still seek for that reverence in your life, because this is the only life you get. That's the reason to do it is you should, um, quarry the spiritual journeys of the spiritual versions and views of the past in order and the values of the past in order to move to the next level. So make yourself up a cheering song. The height of the adventure. It's the next line. The height of the adventure is the height of the country where two village cultures faded into each other. Both of them are lost. So now, now we've gone into the height of the adventure. So we've been on this adventure on this road, like Don Quixote, like Jason the Argonauts going after the Golden Fleece. They're on the quest. You know, if you've played games in the past, you used to be given quests to go and you had to fight a dragon. You had to go, you know, get your team members together and, you know, go into a cave and destroy the troll or whatever. You had to kill something and get points and gather pelts and g gain skills as you went. You know, this we think of this as some kind of modern, amazing thought that we have, but it's really just the journey that life is. Life is that thing. And this is a, a, a prehistoric and a historic and a, an imaginative and a mythological and a true part of our lives that we need the quest. And um, so now we're on that quest within this directive. We've we've reached the, the adventure of the height. We've reached the height of the adventure. Now, if at this point, he's saying, and if you're lost enough to find yourself by now, pull in your ladder road behind you. So he's talking to you. He's saying, hey, Kirk, John, whoever's listening, if you're lost enough to find yourself by now, if you're lost enough, so if, you're, if you've got, you know, if you've gone on that acid trip and you've, you've absconded, you've abstracted yourself from yourself for the, the immediate now for a second, that's what you do when you think, right? When you think about the past, you contemplate, you know, that time you were with uh, the girl of your dreams who you're no longer with for whatever reason. You're, you're not here anymore. You're in the past. You're not present. You're in the past. So, and if you're lost enough, so now he's taking that not only in your own past, but in the humanity all of human history, which is why we read books written 500 years ago like Cervantes' Don Quixote, like why we read books like The Marble Fawn written in the 1860s, why we read the Hom uh, Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey written in you know 800 BCE, why we read the Bible written in whatever the hell that was written, you know, why we read any of these things, um, uh, the Argonautica, is we're trying to live in the past, but not just in the limited little 32 years that I've been on this earth, but I have been alive for thousands of years now because I've experienced the world through literature and poetry. That's the directive. That's the direction. That's the guidance you need. Okay. Um, so that's the adventure world. So if you're lost enough to find yourself by now, pull in your ladder road behind you and put a, a closed up, put up, <laughs> and put a sign up closed to all but me. So if you're there, if you're lost enough to find yourself, if you're in this place of prehistory, pull your up, pull in your ladder road. So he's making a reference, you know, the road is not just a flat road. I think he's talking about it as like a road up to heaven. Now I'm, I believe he's talking about it metaphorically, but th this is what I'm, my whole project is here. 
and, and this is what I think is Frost's project, is Rand's project, whether Peterson knows it or not, it's his project, is to find the upward glance, the reverence, the glory, the exaltation, the serenity and peace that we always um, associate with a, a, a outside of this natural world heavenly thing and that we recognize it as real and on this earth that the ladder road l-a-d-d-e-r ladder is something that you climb and it's a road as well so you're climbing this road now he's saying you know if you think of it as like you're a, a child that you want to uh, be by yourself and in your own world of imagination i think of calvin and hobbes you know, you would go up into your tree fort and you'd pull the ladder behind you so that you could be on this adventure and nobody can follow you. It's just you and now this guide. Or if you're smart, other guides like Cervantes that you can go and enjoy their journeys and go on the journey with them alone in your tree house away from the world of now or the world of your parents or whoever. Oh, Farzana Islam says hi. Well, hello. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so where was I? Okay, and he says, and put a sign up closed, like a closed sign, um, and, and put a sign up closed to all but me. To me being the guide is what he's saying. And you want to put closed just like you went on your storefront. You're not open for business of the world right now because you're in the prehistory of all humanity, which we all share in common. We, we are thousands, you are thousands of years old, not 32 years old. You are thousands of years old. But if you choose to only be 20, 25, 30, then you're, that's all you fucking are. Or you could choose to be ancient. That's your choice. Then make yourself at home. So now we're in this new place. Make yourself at home. The only field now left no bigger than a harness gall. A harness gall is a um, you know, beast of burden. You would have like a, a horse or something or an oxen, and you'd have a harness that would strap onto them. And galling, you know, is like bitter and not good. But but a, a gall, but a gall in this case, I think, refers to chafing on the animal animal might have like a little blister or something like that. So what you get is um uh, what you get is this harness gall, and he's saying this field that we're going there is small. So there's a well, all I get out of this is that there's a bitterness, there's a, a, a nastiness to this past too. So it's not all fun and games when you go back into time. When you go and explore the Iliad, you're exploring death, you're exploring your mortality. And I've talked to people who just cannot talk about death; they're terrified. I don't like to talk about it either, but I try to force myself to talk about it because it's important. And when you explore death and mortality in the Iliad, it could be bitter. It could be scary. It could be tragic. I mean, it is tragic after all, right? First, so now that we're in this new place of ancient time where we've um, traveled through the realms of gold, as Keats put it, we've gone through different realms in the imagination. So we're... we're um, Make yourself at home. The only field now left is no bigger than a harness call. First, there's the children's house of make-believe. Some shattered dishes underneath a pine. The playthings in the playhouse of the children. So first, there's the children's house of make-believe. And so this is probably mythology, legend, fairy, folk tales, perhaps art in general. Um, and it's dismissed by as by so many today as little things. And, you know, like, I, I think it's hard for me to make this argument. I think doctors are noble, important, and critical, and just as important as, as that is art. That if you have a healthy body, but you're depressed, you're going to die anyway. So what the hell is the point of going to a doctor? A doctor can is important, and, and it's one of the most important things you can have in life. You know, um, I Dr. Leonard Peikoff, the philosopher and uh, heir to Ayn Rand, uh, intellectual heir, once put it that if you were to have, you know, uh, if you were to think about who needs to be on a ship, 
And when you're going out on some adventure, a doctor is important. A philosopher doesn't seem as important, but he tried to make the argument, I think, that it is. And I think it's the same thing with the poet. You know, you need to take care of the inner world, the serenity, the peace that you need to, that you want to achieve in, in the inner world if you want um, to enjoy uh, the, the, you know, a life outwardly as well. They go hand in hand. And this is the mind-body dichotomy. I want to take a, a second here to read a small segment about the imagination, the mind, and the body from Don Quixote. And I think this will illuminate a little bit of what I'm talking about. I do not agree with this passage fully because it is a, a representation of the split between the mind and the body that I've talked about so much that I'm trying to rectify, that we do not need a view of a spirit spirit that leaves our body when we die and goes and floats into the ether, ether or whatever, that we can have it here and now uh, and, and in the future, that our Spirit merely refers to our consciousness, our ability to have values. So he's talking about letters and arms, as in, you know, feet of arms or having, you know, blades in his case or swords. Um, so there's a, there's a long passage, but I'm going to just read a short segment of it. The end and goal of letters, I am not speaking now of divine letters, the aim of which is to raise and direct the soul to heaven. For with an end so infinite, no other can be compared. I speak of human letters, the end of which is to establish distributive justice. Give to every man that which is his, and see and take care that good laws are observed. An end undoubtedly noble, lofty, and deserving of high praise, but not such as should be given to the, that sought by arms, which have for their end and object peace, the greatest boon that men can desire in his life. I'll stop there. There's more, there's more probably that's a little bit relevant, but I don't want to go on forever with that. But notice how he breaks it up, is that there is the end and goal of letters, not now speaking of divine letters, the aim of which is to raise and direct the soul to heaven. So he has split humanity into two types, or human soul and the human and the man, you, into two things. There's the divine, which is, you know, there's, so there's words, there's bi biblical stories, and there's, um, you know, a man on a stage at a church preaching, you know, glory, glory, hallelujah to you. And those holy words are to direct your aim at a metaphysical outside of the natural world, heaven. And then there's the earthly good of justice, of distributing who deserves or just deserts, who gets what and why. And that is part of the problem. I take that to be part of the problem that we're trying to rectify here. And that I think is the directive of Robert Frost is the directive of you don't need to have a separation like that. You need, you can do it together. They can be one and the same, the imagination. You can go back in time through the body of reading and you can gain that spirit in yourself and that there's no separation of the two. Um, Okay, so you can go into the, the era of mythology, mythology, legend, fairy, and folktales, and art in general. These things are dismissed today as little things, but you should, as the next section of the poem says, weep for what little things could make them glad. So remember, we're talking about a children's playhouse and playthings. And in this children's playhouse or play with these playthings under a pine, which brings us back to this idea of, you know, ancient Greek pagans seeing nymphs in the, in the forest, which is why I love the marble fawn, because that's kind of what happens is people, an expatriate, you know, in um, Rome is, you know, all of a sudden embroiled in this thing where he sees what may be a real fawn and he thinks he sees all these, you know, types of, uh, uh, fawns and, and nymphs and these fairy tales that are come to life. And that's kind of a wonderful 
beautiful thing about being a child is that those things are real to some degree. They've, and that's what it feels like to be ancient, I believe, is that you go through the forest and you might think maybe Pan, you know, the god of the forest, is out there somewhere. And there's some nymphs and some forest nymphs along with him. Um, so weep for what little things could make those children glad. So at first reading, it seems to mean, um, it's, it seems like it's scorning playthings, but it's not. It's saying that we've lost a sense of our imaginary, imaginative abilities. You know, the workshop of the imagination is literature and poetry. That's the workshop. So you need to go in and play with this workshop. Now, the house that is no more a house, but which was a house in earnest, though its foundations are overgrown and steadily disappearing, sounds like the religious tradition which was at the very heart of every civilization and art form. Through all of history, if you look back in time, the art of the past was based in the, the religious um, ceremonies of that era. You know, if you go into 16th century uh, Europe, you're going to find a lot of Christian stuff, right? If you go into Muslim times, that, you're going to find, you know, Islam, art of, of Islamic culture. If you go into ancient Greek, you're finding the, the religion of ancient Greek art. But our destination today in 2018 or in 1947 when he was writing this, but our destiny, your destination and your destiny is the brook that was the original source of water for the house and around which the children played the waters of life, perhaps the spirit of vitality and spontaneous living that man shares with nature, serene above the turbulence of the valleys we have left. So that's the next section. Then for the, let me, I'm reading the poem. Then for the house that is no more a house, but only a belly-laced cellar hole. Belly-laced is is a word he invented. And it, just think of it as lilacs for now. If you have a question, you can direct message me and I'll tell you more. But basically, uh, think of lilacs on the cellar hole. So the, we have this house that is no more a house, but only a, a belly-laced cellar hole. So think of a, a picture of cellar, but it's just the hole. Now only closing, now slowly closing like a dent in dough. And if you, you know, punch your fist in a dough, it, there's a dent, but it can also reemerge this dent in dough this was no playhouse so he's saying now it's not a playhouse but a house in earnest your destination and your destiny is a brook that was the water of the house you talking to you and pointing at you you if this is going into your ear holes right now your destination and your destiny is a brook that was the water of the house cold as a spring is yet so near its source, too lofty and original to rage. We know the valley streams that when aroused will leave their tatters hung on barb and thorn. I have kept, so now we're in this new place that he's gotten to, this playhouse where these children played, or you could think of it as ancient civilizations, where they played with, um, you know, gods and goddesses and Cupid, you know, Cupid with his arrow. I mean, we think of that as silly today. We think of, you know, we put on little cards as this fat baby. But these people in ancient times believed that was real. They thought it was true. They thought there was something important and profound there. And so we think of it as little playthings. And we, but he is saying, weep, weep, um, that we have lost our gladness in such thing. And your, here's the important thing, I think the crux of the whole poem. Your destination and your destiny is a brook that was the water of the house. So if we think of, let's, let's go over the whole thing real quick as an analogy. So we're going back in this time of imagination slash prehistory that we're, we all are a part of, right? We all, all humans have this tradition. So we're back in this imagination era place. Picture a house. Now the house is, at the beginning, a house that's not a house in earnest, but at the end, we find out it's a playhouse. But it's a playhouse that is not a playhouse. So maybe it's, you know, he's taking it as an analogy for, the, for all house, houses of God throughout all of history. But it's not a playhouse. There's something earnest and important there. Whether it's a, an ancient Greek church or play, you know, a, a temple, the temple of the Dorphic temple, 
Um, or if it's, um, you know, a Muslim synagogue, mosque, a Jewish synagogue, a church, whatever it is, all of them are houses of God, of worship, a cathedral. They're all the same thing. But what do they all have in common? They're all drinking from the same source, the brook that surrounds that house, metaphorically. And that is your destiny, is to get move away from the actual house that is no longer a house and drink from the actual brook, the spiritual values from which these houses were attempting to share the you know spiritual values from. Often wrongly, but they tried. And then we have the broken drinking goblet like the grail. So that's the next section. We're almost done here. Cold as a spring as yet so near its source, too lofty and too lo and lo original to rage. We know the valley streams and when aroused will leave their tatters hung on barb and thorn. Here's the next section. I have kept, I have kept hidden in the instep arch of an old cedar at the waterside, a broken drinking goblet like the grail under a spell so the wrong ones can't find it, so can't get saved, as St. Mark says. They mustn't. I stole the, guard, uh, the goblet from the children's playhouse. So uh, I think that's, that's wonderful because <clears throat> he's saying that he, you know, the Holy Grail is this uh, awesome, powerful spiritual thing he has found the Holy Grail. He's hidden it in parable. Just like St. Mark or the Christ spoke in parables so that only those who can hear would be saved. And what he means by that, I think, is that you need to be able to have the patience and the fortitude and the strength and the will and the courage to take the time to figure out how to untangle the parables for yourself. And when you do that, you have drank in from the Holy Grail, not supernaturally, but from the Holy Grail that is the spiritual values of all these things we've been talking about that is present, for instance, in the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. So um, this is the human tradition handed down in poetry. All human spiritual values have been handed down in poetry. Um, until recent times. It's always been poetry. And I don't mean poetry like the directive by Frost. I mean poetry as in the um, Homer's Iliad is a poem, or even the Bible is a poem, or, the, or Dante's Inferno is a poem, or the Argonautica is a poem. They're all poetry. And these spiritual values is the poetry they're trying to find and pass on that human tradition uh, that you come from. So you, But you don't come from that tradition if you do not seek it. That's his directive to you. Go seek these bloody things. Go read them. Go read things that are above your pay grade that you cannot figure out. Now, he's not one of the things, uh, and this is where you can prepare yourself for the chaos to come and where you can order your life in a better way than you ever imagined. Frost is deliberately oblique in his presentation of moral insights. So there is a tradition of moral poetry where you would basically um, say, you know, in the Elizabethan era, the, the time around Shakespeare, you would say something like, my mind to me a kingdom is. And then you would list all the things of why your mind is a kingdom. And he, in this poem, uh, in this poem by Dreyer, for instance, he talks about how you can have all your external things, but I have my internal values and you know priorities. Excuse me, and I'm ordered and serene and happy in what I have internally, and I don't because I'm not tempted by all those things. And and, and the Elizabethan model of talking about moral insights is to simply just say it outright, very explicitly. My mind is a kingdom to me. And it's a kingdom because I can go inward and enjoy my my own you know uh, my own going inward and, and thinking and dreaming and imagining while you're out striving and playing and hoping that you can create whatever you want to create and you create great temples and monolithic knee great monolithic knees that are going to fade in time whoop de doo for you 
And um, the, the point is that instead of doing that, instead of going after the, that monolithic needs, you can find it, his directive is you can find it in parables. So Frost is not the type to simply tell you my mind to me a kingdom is and, to find, and what serenity is and explicit. He tells it to you in a little bit more of a round, oblique presentation, a roundabout way. He takes pleasure in the puzzle an introduction, in direction of his parable, slowing the readers, um, slowing the reader, so that we can enjoy listening to the vigorous collo- colloquial flow of his voice and savor all the details of the journey. That's what makes Frost a great poet, and I think he's one of the better poets. He's not given credit for his greatness. He's very, very strong in his ability to force you to slow down. Like if you're going to read Frost, you have to slow down. You have to read it bit by bit. And then the other part is we're never away from the level of concrete narratives, the play thing, the child house play house. You know, there's a point where there's dishes. He's talking about dishes, about play things. Um, you know, a dent, it's uh, the cellar doors, firkins, the cask that we talked about. You know, uh, the cellar door or the cellar hole that uh, was the religious church, which is now just a cellar hole with lilacs around it, like you put over a grave, and it's slowly closing like a dent in dough. So that we never leave the level of concrete narrative. And the directive is ultimately to the human spirit that it should struggle on the upward path, that ladder road, not just a normal road that you thought of when you first started reading this poem where it's just a road, but it's a ladder road, one to heaven, a heaven internally, psychologically of achieving higher and higher things of, you know, you get one promotion and another promotion and you get better and better at your job. Even if you stay within the job, you're better and better. Like Howard Rourke, you know, it's why it's a great symbolic metaphorical story is he starts off in the gutter of the, the quarries and he rises up to the building of a, 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 the biggest skyscraper in the world. That's the upward ladder path. And that's the human spirit, that it should struggle on that upward path and that it should ally itself with all that both man and nature have created in both past and present to bring peace and renewal out of contemporary chaos. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's what I hope you get out of poems for people who hate poetry. So I hope you subscribe to the show. I would love to hear any thoughts you have about this, but you can listen on iTunes. This is, uh, um, you know, I get the most comments from people listening on iTunes. So check it out. You just go to iTunes or whatever, Stitcher, wherever, and type in poems for people who hate poetry. And you can listen on your podcast. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed Directive by Robert Frost.